Hey guys, it's Bella and welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all having an incredible day today. In today's video, we're going to be covering another Mystery Monday case, but before we do, I just want to thank today's sponsor, Vessi. I know Vessi shoes might just seem like cute sneakers, but there's so much more. They are 100% waterproof, slash proof, and slip proof, which has been amazing for the stormy weather we've been having in Brisbane lately. It has just been non-stop, and I was out for lunch with my parents the other day, and it literally just started hailing on us. It was not a vibe. Honestly, these shoes would have been so useful to have in Canada as well because they're made from Dymatex, which is a dual climate knit material. So it keeps you cool in summer, which is perfect for here in Brisbane, but it also keeps you warm in winter. So they're amazing winter shoes as well. They're just, they're pretty much good for everything. I don't just wear them when it's gonna be wet. I also wear them just to walk Mia around my block as well. I wish I had these shoes as a kid because jumping in puddles was one of my favorite pastimes. And with these shoes, it literally wouldn't have been an issue because I wouldn't have got soggy feet and they're so easy to clean. You just wash them off with a bit of water and you can also just chuck them in the washing machine and they're good to go. And the best part about it is that they're also sustainably made. Vessi is actually having an early Black Friday sale at the moment too. So if you guys do want to check that out, make sure you head to my bio. I have the link for the sale in there. And if you do happen to miss the Black Friday sale, you can also use my code, which I'll put on the screen. I'll also have it in the description for you. I have all of the information and links in the description and that will get you an extra $25 off. So let's go ahead ahead and get into today's case and today we are going to be talking about the disappearance of Lee Ochi. Lee was born on the 21st of August in 1979 in Honolulu, Hawaii to Vicky Felton and Donald Ochi. Both her parents were military members who met in 1977 while they were both stationed in California. They got married after a year of dating and were then transferred to the military base in Honolulu which is where they had Lee of course. Shortly after in 1981 their marriage came to an end due to irreconcilable differences and they went their separate ways. Donna relocated to Germany and Vicky left the military and took Lee with her to Tupelo, Mississippi to be closer to her parents. Despite the fact that Donna was stationed overseas, he and Lee had a very close relationship and she would visit him often and Donald, of course, loved the time they spent together, loved that she was so open-minded, always happy to immerse herself in all the different activities that they did in Germany and even trying to learn the language a little bit. In 1991, after a year in Iraq's desert storm, Donna relocated to Fort Myer in Virginia and he and Leigh got to spend a lot more time together. She was adventurous, easygoing, and like I said, open-minded. She wasn't afraid to try new things and get a little bit dirty. They went to the shooting range together, they went four-wheel driving together, and they drove over this mud puddle and Leigh got completely covered in mud, which they both thought was hilarious, and it just sounds like they had a lot of fun together. As I'm sure is obvious by now, Lee lived with her mother Vicky in a ranch-style home at 105 Honey Lotus drive at the end of a cul-de-sac. They lived there with Vicky's husband Barney Yabra. However, they split up in the summer of 1992, just a few weeks before Lee's disappearance, and Barney moved into an apartment elsewhere in Tupelo. Growing up, Lee was known for being outgoing, smart, kind, and sweet, and she was known for her love of pizza and animals, which I totally relate to that. Particularly, she loved horses and horseback riding, and she spent a lot of the summer of 1992 riding horses at a stable on Thomas Street. She was known to be a good student and quite intelligent, especially at math. However, she was known to exhibit disruptive behaviors such as fidgeting, which made other children avoid her despite the fact that she just wanted to be friends with everybody. I was a little confused by this because all I could find about her disruptive behaviors was the fidgeting and I don't know about you but I feel like that must have been pretty bad fidgeting to make like all the other kids want to avoid you. Although kids can be pretty freaking harsh. The summer of 1992 was a blast for Lee. She spent a horseback riding at the local stable as I mentioned. She also turned 13 that summer and she had a boyfriend named Jordan Morse. He was 11 years old but he went to a different school and he got her a pair of like 3D cat earrings for her birthday. Obviously she was a real animal lover so she loved the earrings and the two spoke nearly every single day on the phone because obviously they couldn't see each other at school because they went to different schools. Both Jordan and Lee had some trouble making friends at school so they always looked forward to coming home after a day at school and being able to talk to each other on the phone. On the 26th of August in 1992 Lee got home at around 8 p.m. after having been at an event with friends and when she got home the front door was locked meaning her mother 
and Vicky wasn't home yet. So she decided to venture around the neighborhood asking neighbors if she could stay with them until her mum got home because I guess it seemed to be a pretty safe neighborhood. This little cul-de-sac, they all kind of knew each other. Lee knew all the people on the streets. She felt comfortable with going to their houses, asking them if she could chill with them until her mother got home. At around 8.45 p.m. Lee knocked on the door of one of their neighbors, Mitzi Phillips, saying she was locked out. She wanted to stay until her mother Vicky got home. And of course, Mitzi had no problem with letting Lee stay. But after just a few minutes of Lee being there, Vicky got home and Lee left. Mitzi said nothing seemed off with Lee. She was happy, she was talkative, and all seemed good. That night, Hurricane Andrew was starting to head through Mississippi after already having gone through Louisiana and Florida and leaving over 180,000 people homeless. By the time Hurricane Andrew did get to Mississippi though, it had been downgraded. So there were just forecasts of like some pretty hectic thunderstorms happening that night and the next day. And Lee understandably was pretty scared of thunderstorms. I mean, I'm 23 and a thunderstorm freaks me out a bit. And so that night she decided to sleep with Vicky in her mother's bed. The next morning on the 27th of August, Vicky woke up at about 6.45 a.m. and found Lee still sleeping soundly in her bed. She went and had a shower and she finished at around 7 a.m., came out of the bedroom and Lee was awake. And she remembers that it was around 7 a.m. because she went out to get the morning paper at that time. When she came back inside, Lee and her had breakfast together. They spoke about their plans for the day and also their plans to go and get Taco Bell that night after Lee and her grandmother got home from attending an open home at her middle school. After breakfast, Vicky left for work at around 7.35, 7.45 a.m. And she worked really close to where they lived. She worked at a local manufacturing company called Leggett and Platt. And she arrived at work at around 7.50 a.m. Although this was the first time she was leaving Lee home alone. So she was a little worried about that. When she got to work, Vicky borrowed her boss's weather radio so she could keep track of the weather, which was getting worse and worse as the day progressed. At around 8.30 a.m., she called home to check on Lee as the weather was just forecasted to get even worse and Vicky and Lee had a special ring because like a lot of kids Lee didn't want to answer the phone or the door if she didn't know who was calling or knocking. So Vicky would call once, let it ring twice, then she would hang up and then she would call again and that's how Lee would know it was Vicky calling. However, Lee never answered the phone. After Lee didn't answer the call, there are some differing reports as to what happened. Some reports say that Vicky left work straight away. Other reports say she first called her mother to go check on Lee. But whatever the case was, she ended up leaving work by 8.45 a.m. to head home and go and check on Lee. When she got home, the garage door was open and the light inside of the garage garage was still on which means it had to have been activated in the last several minutes because it's like kind of on a timer after you use the garage the lights on and then after a few minutes of it not have been used the light turns off when she got to the house she noticed that the front door was unlocked despite the fact that she had locked it just before she left for work and then upon entering the house she noticed that there was blood smeared throughout she checked the entire house the shed the pool area, but Lee was nowhere to be found. At 9 a.m., 15 minutes after arriving home, Vicky called 911 to report her daughter missing. Lee's grandmother, her stepfather Barney, and a local reporter who happened to hear the news, I suppose, on a one of those like police radios or something turned up shortly after the call and then two patrolmen turned up shortly after that. When investigators arrived, they found no signs of forced entry. Fresh type O blood was found upstairs in Lee's bedroom, in her bathroom, on her bedroom door, in the master bedroom and also the upstairs hallway. There was also a blood trail leading from the hallway to the living room and there was also hair and blood stuck to the doorway, indicating that Lee had likely hit her head in the struggle. One of her nightgowns and her bra were found bloodstained in her laundry hamper, indicating that she had sustained an injury above her neck. This was corroborated by a fist-sized pool of blood in the living room, which suggested that she had hit her head and then was laying on the carpet for a certain amount of time afterward. As Lee was a type A or type O blood type, it was assumed that the blood in the house did belong to her, although DNA testing at the time wasn't advanced enough to confirm this. 
In the master bathroom, police found blood in the sink as well as a pink haze on the countertop which suggested that the killer or attacker had tried to clean up a little bit after themselves in the bathroom. And investigators did find this a little odd because they didn't think a random attacker would try and clean up after themselves and there was blood all throughout the rest of the house anyway. It's also been theorised that Lee's nightgown was what was used in an attempt to clean the countertop in the bathroom. Bathroom. Now, Vicky said that Lee was wearing her nightgown when she left for work in the morning, but that she was able to determine what Lee was wearing when she left the house based on what was missing from her closet. Apparently also missing from the house was Lee's old sleeping bag, a pair of Lee's shoes, and also her reading glasses. Due to a lack of evidence, it couldn't be determined if Lee was taken on foot or if she was placed into a vehicle. However, it was theorized that she knew her attacker because there was no signs of forced entry Entry, as I mentioned and she never answered the phone or the door for anybody that she didn't know. I mean her and Vicky even had that special call just for her to answer the call. That same day 12 patrolmen with bloodhounds searched a half mile or 800 meter radius around the house but due to the weather the dogs were unable to pick up on Lee's scent. They searched a 10 inch ditch which ran along the property and then turned their attention to an 80 acre area of bush and trees but found nothing. At the same time investigators spoke to locals. They searched through the Knox landfill in Chicksaw County and used bloodhounds to search the family vehicles but again found nothing. That afternoon Lee's boyfriend Jordan Morse got off the bus from school and ran home so that he could have his afternoon call with Lee that as I mentioned he always looked forward to, both of them did, but instead he was met with Lee's mother Vicky's voice on the other end of the line and she didn't really tell him much about Lee's disappearance. In fact he didn't even understand that Lee was missing until he saw it on the news with his family. Now something I found weird is that police never even spoke to Jordan. He's 11 so I don't think he had anything to do with the disappearance but he was Lee's boyfriend and they spoke together every afternoon on the phone so surely they should have like spoken to him to see if there was some sort of information he could have given them. Maybe Lee knew who was coming to the house that day and told Jordan the night before. I don't know but it just seems like a missed opportunity to not even speak to him. By August 28th, local citizens of Tupelo helped search West Tupelo for Lee, and then by the next day, aerial searches also were being conducted. Originally, investigators believed they were looking for a missing girl, but eventually it became clear that they were looking for a body, most likely. One week after Lee's disappearance, a $1,000 reward was posted for any information as to her whereabouts. Two weeks later, this reward doubled and Vicky and Lee's home on Honey Locust Drive was closed off as a crime scene and taped off which just seems strange to me that they did it two weeks after the disappearance. At this time Vicky hired a private investigator as well as running some ads through the local paper but unfortunately no leads came of either. On the 1st of September a task force consisting of four officers was set up to look into the disappearance and on the 6th of September Donald Ochi, Lee's father, was able to obtain an emergency one month long leave from work. He moved to Tupelo for that month to aid in the search for his daughter and he actually said that originally Vicky downplayed the entire disappearance to him so he just thought that Lee had run away based on what Vicky had said. He didn't even realize how dire the situation was until he actually arrived in Tupelo. Donald also said at this time he started to kind of look into Vicky a little bit because one, she downplayed the whole disappearance for so long to him and two, a lot of the locals were telling him that he should look into Lee's mother. He also said that from the day he arrived in Tupelo that he believed Lee was unfortunately dead and that she had been beaten to death in her and Vicky's home. Authorities at this point started to interview anybody who was even remotely connected to Lee in any way, besides her boyfriend Jordan for some reason. They interviewed family, friends, teachers, neighbours, and they also conducted three polygraph tests on her mother Vicky Felton, her father Donald Ochi, and her stepfather Barney Yarborough. Now obviously polygraphs are not at all reliable, you should always take them with a grain of salt, they're not even admissible in some court 
reports because they're just so unreliable. However, the three polygraph tests were definitely interesting. Lee's father, Donald, passed his polygraph with flying colors and he was also stationed in Virginia at the time of her disappearance, so he was immediately ruled out as a suspect. Lee's stepfather, Barney, also passed his polygraph after days of interrogation and he had been fully cooperative with investigators throughout this time and was also fully cooperative within the search, trying to search for Lee in the woods, in the ditches, like all around the surrounding areas. He was very involved. He was also able to provide a solid alibi for the day Lee disappeared, so he was also ruled out as a suspect. Vicky, however, was subject to three different polygraph tests. Each test was conducted by a different person and she failed all three. She tried to explain this away, saying, I've just lost my daughter. This is just the way my body's reacting. However, Donald and Barney both lost a daughter and managed to pass their polygraph tests. So clearly from this point forward, Vicky was definitely looked into as a person of interest, but was never officially considered a suspect. The case was talked about quite a lot by the locals, as I'm sure you can imagine rumors were running wild. There was one rumor that a local doctor had actually burned her in a barn in Tupelo. There was another rumor that her stepfather Barney was abusive towards her and these rumors were actually interfering with the case so much so that the police chief at the time, Billy White, had to instate a gag order on his investigators. So if any of them were caught talking about the case, they would actually suffer a two-week suspension from the police force. Anyway, at this point, investigators were looking into any and all leads that they could find. They were investigating locals. They questioned a Northeast Mississippi Community College student who was working at a McDonald's in Boonville, which is roughly about 30 miles or 50 kilometers outside of Tupelo or north of Tupelo. He told detectives that during his shift on the 4th of December that a young girl who matched Lee's description came through the drive-thru. She was in a blue truck which was being driven by a black male. Police were able to track this man down and they were able to determine that the child in question was not Lee. On the 9th of September in 1992, Vicky received a letter to her and Lee's home at Honey Locust Drive which was addressed to her ex and Lee's stepfather B. Yabra. Honey Locust was misspelt Honey Locust and there were six 29 cent stamps on the envelope, twice the amount needed and they were like little love hearts with the word love inside. And the letter was postmarked in Boonville which is where the previous false sighting of Lee was. When Vicky's ex Barney opened the letter, all that was inside was Lee's reading glasses which had been missing since her disappearance. Both the Mississippi State Crime Lab and the FBI performed handwriting and forensic tests on the letter, however, nothing turned up any leads. The stamps on the letter had been tested for DNA as well, but as it turns out, they were actually wet with water rather than saliva. The person who sent the glasses has never been identified, and both investigators and Lee's father, Donald, believed that it was sent to throw the investigation off. Over the next few months, there really were not a lot of leads in the case. Donald Ochi at this time really wanted to make sure that his daughter's case wasn't forgotten. He printed out missing persons flyers and handed them out to interstate bus service stations, interstate truck drivers, local businesses, and also enrolled her information to the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children, as well as Child Quest. He took to TV shows as well, a show named 2020, an unnamed Japanese crime show, and the Geraldo Riviera show, which he made the accusation that someone in the family was involved in his daughter's disappearance. Donald also just searching for answers enlisted the help of psychics, all of whom claimed that a body of water was involved in Lee's disappearance. Donald came out saying that anybody in his position would do the same thing because they got nothing to lose at that point. Unfortunately though these efforts did cost him money and he was going broke doing so and was unable to get any leads from them. On the 9th of November in 1993, 14 months after Lee's disappearance, a new lead finally turned up. An 18-year-old farmer named Ray Chance was walking through his soybean field in Monroe County when he discovered a human skull with only four teeth and a few other assorted bones. The state medical examiner's office enlisted the help of a contract dentist who confirmed the skull belonged to 13-year-old Lee Ochi. Word spread and Lee's dentist heard of the news and got in contact with the medical examiner's office to ensure that her most recent 
and up-to-date dental records had been used to identify the remains and it turns out that they hadn't been. The skull was then correctly re-identified as having belonged to a 27-year-old woman named Pollyanna Sue Keith who had disappeared from Shannon, Mississippi in March of 1993. Lee's parents, Donald and Vicky, were of course outraged by this. Donald said that it was the most difficult thing that they had to endure throughout the entire ordeal. And this is a letter I'm about to read you that Vicky wrote that was published in the Hattiesburg American. It read, if my daughter's dentist, Dr. Richard Warriner, had not personally intervened and contacted authorities himself to verify that the records they used were the most current, the misidentification might never have been realized. Rumors, speculation, and false reports about a loved one's fate cannot be forgotten once placed in your mind. Believe me, little can be done to ease the pain and suffering families experience in these cases, but we surely do not need the state of Mississippi to compound them with incompetence. In August of 1997, investigators released the fact that they did have a suspect in the case, but declined to name who. A few years later, after having no substantial leads, Tupelo police decided to re-examine Lee's backyard. Around the time she went missing, the Tupelo Public Works Office had been installing rocks for drainage to control at the end of Honey Locust Drive. So when Lee disappeared and Hurricane Andrew came through, this work was halted for a time before being later installed. Authorities thought it may have been a possibility that Lee may have accidentally been buried by those working on the site. So the area was dug up and cadaver dogs were brought in, but no trace of Lee was ever found. In September of 2016, investigators finally took down the testimony of a garden center worker who said that she had seen something sketchy the morning of Lee's disappearance. She said she'd been driving by Honey Locust Drive when she saw a male and a female walking in the torrential rain. She said the male was a little bit short, that he was not not chubby but like kind of thick built. He had grey hair and a scruffy beard and he was wearing a green army jacket and this actually matched the description of Barney Yarbrough. The woman said that she was going to offer the two a lift because they were walking in the torrential rain but as she got closer she decided they seemed a little bit sketchy and decided not to. The man kind of pulled his hood up over himself and then wrapped his arms around the female, pulled her into him and when the woman looked up up. She didn't look like injured or anything, but she looked very frightened and the garden center worker thought that something just seemed really off about them. The witness did contact the non-emergency line as soon as she found out about Lee's disappearance to report what she'd seen and she was told that somebody would get in contact with her to take her statement. However, that did not happen for years and years and years later until 2016. And that is all of the information for this case. There's not a lot of evidence, there are not a lot of leads to go off, and the case eventually went cold. Police said that there's very little evidence in regards to who committed this crime. They have spoken to several persons of interest, but no one has ever been charged. So with that, let's go ahead and talk about theories. There are a few theories that aren't really talked about as much because they seem more unlikely, such as a robbery gone wrong, a random kidnapping, or the premeditated work of a pedophile ring. As there's so little evidence, there are so many possibilities. However, there are three main theories that are talked about. The first theory is that Lee's mother, Vicky, had something to do with her daughter's disappearance. There were a lot of rumors going around that Vicky was abusive towards Lee. Former classmates of Lee said that she came to school on occasion in a really somber mood and on one occasion she had bruises on her body and a black eye and that Lee kind of just shrugged it off as being an accident when a horse's apple hit her in the face at the local stables which no one really questioned because as I mentioned it was very well known that Lee loved horses. Another classmate however came forward to say that Lee was sitting alone in the playground at recess one time eating berries and this classmate came over to her, warned her that the berries might be poisonous and Lee said, I don't care, maybe I want to die. Lee did speak to a counselor after this but insisted she was fine and that it was just a joke. Around the time of Lee's disappearance though as well, Vicky was kind of acting a little bit sketchy. She was really uncooperative with investigators and she was very like aloof. There were also factors in her story that investigators just thought were off. It's like she was apparently so concerned that she left work after having been there for only 40 minutes, which in and of itself is 
strange. Like she just happens to leave work so concerned about her daughter 40 minutes after she got to work on the day that her daughter disappeared. But it's also the fact that she left her work so soon after getting there, but then it still took her 15 whole minutes to call the police after getting home, despite the fact that there was blood everywhere in the house. Police also thought it was a little strange that she knew exactly what Lee was wearing when she'd been taken, considering when Vicky left the house, Lee was wearing her nightgown that was still at the house and bloodstained. Detective Aguirre, who was on the case, said that he wouldn't even be able to do that for his own children. He doesn't know every single item of clothing that is in their closet. Lee's father, Donald, also said that he thought something was sketchy about Vicky from the get-go, which I actually already mentioned previously. He thought it was sketchy that when Vicky called him two days after Lee disappeared that she was acting like Lee had just run away. Like she honestly did not explain the gravity of the situation to him at all. He had no idea until he arrived in Tupelo the extent of what had happened, the fact that there was actually blood throughout the house. He said Vicky was not forthcoming with any information at all and he didn't see her cry once. Vicky of course maintains her innocence and says she doesn't care what people think about her, that all that matters is finding her daughter. The second theory is that Lee's stepfather, Barney Yabra, had something to do with this. Now, as I mentioned, there were rumors going around that Barney was abusive towards Lee and a family friend actually said that she had heard Barney whip and hit Lee. Lee's boyfriend, Jordan Morse, also said that Lee had mentioned to him that she had been locked out of the house by Barney once as punishment, that she was afraid of Barney, and that Barney screamed at her and yelled at her on occasion. According to Donald, Vicky he kept Lee from seeing him too often because she was afraid that Lee would say something she wasn't meant to say. Donald also claimed that an investigator told him that Barney had confessed to abusing Lee. However, the detective on the case, Aguirre, said that he had not heard this, so he doesn't know who told Donald that because he hadn't heard about this confession. Vicky also said that Lee had never expressed any fear of Barney to her. Now, the last theory is one that was actually provided by Vicky herself. According to Vicky, a local man named Oscar Mike Kearns is responsible for Lee's disappearance. He was a vacation Bible school and Sunday school teacher who worked at the Holy Trinity Lutheran Church, which the family attended. And he, just like Lee, loved horses and horseback riding. He lived only about one and a half kilometers away from from Honey Locust Drive and according to Vicky, he owned horses and asked Lee if she wanted to go riding with him sometime. In May of 1993, nine months after Lee's disappearance, Kearns actually abducted a 15 year old girl who he'd met through the church and the details are sketchily similar to Lee's case. This girl was home alone at 7 a.m. when Kearns turned up to her house, said, I'll give you a lift to school. She accepted and he instead drove her to Memphis, Tennessee, where he proceeded to sexually assault her before dropping her off at school. After dropping her off at school, the girl immediately contacted police. Kearns pled guilty and was sentenced to 24 years in prison with 16 years suspended. So technically altogether an eight year sentence. In October of 1997, however, he was released after just serving four years. Not long after his release, in 1999, he kidnapped a married couple and sexually assaulted the wife. He was sent back to prison and his release date was set for March of 2019, although I couldn't find much on his release. According to Vicky, around the time of Lee's disappearance, Kern started acting really strangely. He was avoiding eye contact with her. He would also randomly show up at the house, which is something he never did before Lee went missing. And Vicky also says that he is someone Lee may have felt comfortable enough to open the door for, which would explain why there was no signs of forced entry. Tupelo police and FBI tried to speak to him on multiple occasions, but each time he lawyered up and refused to speak to them. And he also refused to take a polygraph test. And that is all of the information that I have for you guys. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below and what theory you believe. Personally, I'm inclined to believe it was either Lee's mother, Vicky, because she was acting really sketchily at the time of her disappearance and afterwards, and she failed all three polygraphs, or that it had something to do with Kearns, who was obviously just a cooked guy in general. But as I said, I would love to hear in the comments down below what you guys think, what theory you think is the most plausible, and hopefully I will see you guys in my next video. Bye guys.